Welcome everybody. Thank you uh, for joining us. Yeah, that better? Is that better? Yep. Okay. Um, and yes, we are here at Fields Pond and we are welcoming um, Corey Stearns, who is a wildlife biologist for Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. And he is here to talk with us about eight different species of bats in Maine and Maine um, IFNW's research and monitoring effects, efforts, excuse me, on um, what you can do to support the local bat populations. And I would also just like to give a little shameless plug for a few items that we have coming up here at Fields Pond, which um, will be this Saturday. We have our Winter Fest, which is our family friendly, um, fun extravaganza for all things winter. That's from 10 to 2. If you are interested, we have a travel log for Game Adventures. So that will be on the 16th. It's also a hybrid program, so 6 p.m. Um, we have our winter ecology series continues. Um, we have a bird walk and tree ID this coming Saturday, right? No, it's later this month, excuse me. Um, we do have our full moon snowshoe hike coming up on the 23rd at 5 p.m. So come join us. There's lots of things to do here at Fields Pond. And without further ado, I will hand the microphone to you. All right, how's that sound? We good? And right here, good for standing too? All right. So let's see. So thanks to Audubon for hosting me. Thanks for everybody in person and uh, listening online. So um, I'll start out here. If the computer will go, which it's not. Hmm. Well, no, it's going to go too fast. So, yeah. So I'm the small mammal biologist for Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. And my first slide, I just wanted to, you know, say, talk a little bit about what a small mammal biologist does. So uh, I'm the state lead for um, all small mammals. So anything that's small, furry, and is not considered a game species, essentially. Um, so that includes monitoring, research, conservation, and um, development reviews when we have to weigh in on development projects. Um, but there's really uh, just a few species that I deal with on, spend most of my time with. That's bats, uh, New England cottontail rabbits, which is a state endangered species, and the northern bog lemming, which is a state threatened species. Um, state I work statewide out of the Augusta office. So I thought I'd first just talk about um, bat biology and bats kind of around the world because they're a really cool uh, group of animals. Uh, they've been on the planet for a long time. They evolved about 50 million years ago. Um, and there's over a thousand species in the world, which is the second most of any mammalian group behind only the rodents. Um, and they've spread across the globe. They're in all terrestrial areas in the world, really, except the real polar region. So they've evolved a lot of different, um, have a lot of different adaptations, um, evolved to live in a wide variety of habitats. Um, and they've evolved a wide variety of um, food choices. So there's a lot of um, nectar eating bats uh, that have long tongues and lap up nectar from flowers like uh, a hummingbird would. There's some bats that actually can catch fish. Uh, there's a whole bunch of fruit bats that have uh, pretty unusual compared to what we have. Um, they're pretty different from what we have here. Um, they have bigger eyes, they're out during the day, and they only eat fruit. Um, and there's a few species of vampire bats, uh, none of which are anywhere close to me. Um, but the majority that we have in North America and all eight species that we have here in Maine are insectivores, like this silver-haired bat. Um, so they eat moss, um, flies, beetles, anything that's out uh, during the nighttime flying around, they'll grab it. So bats are the only truly flying mammals. Um, flying squirrels really just kind of fall with style. They get to a high point and they glide down. They don't actually have powered flight. Uh, bats come in a variety of sizes. Smallest is a little three inch um, bumblebee bat and largest is a six foot wingspan giant golden crown flying fox, which is uh, pretty incredible to Imagine a six foot bat flying over your head in the middle of the day, but um, they're out there and 
uh, other parts of the world. Um, largest bat we have here is the hoary bat, uh, about a foot wingspan. Uh, bats are also unusual in the small mammal world in, in that they can have a long lifespan. They can live over 30 years. Both small mammals like your mice or your um, squirrels or things have very short lifespans. Like two years is a long time for a small mammal. So bats are pretty unusual in that regard. Uh, most species of bat, though not all, uh, are nocturnal and they use echolocation, which I'll talk more about here in a minute to help them navigate through the through the night. Um, and depending on where you are in the world and what species you're talking about, there's bats that hibernate, there's bats that migrate, and there's others that are just active year round. So here in Maine, we have five species that hibernate here in the state and three that migrate out of the state for the winter. Uh, bats are also really important for uh, the world's ecosystems. Um, there's over 500 species of flowers that are reliant on uh, bat pollination. Uh, most, a lot of them are uh, cactuses in the agave plant. Um, bat, fruit bats are really important for seed dispersal. Um, and insectivorous bats can eat up, up to half their body weight insects a night. So they're um, pest control for, for people, um, eating those biting insects. And they also um, save uh, US farmers about $23 billion a year by reducing crop damage and decreasing pesticide use. Um, and also bat guano in some parts of the world is used as fertilizer. So bats, a bat wing is um, pretty analogous to our arms, uh, same bone structure. They have a uh, humerus, they have a radius and ulna, a wrist and fingers. Uh, it's best seen in this, for the people in person. We've got a skeleton over there on the table to look at. But the bat wing essentially is the, the, the arm and then it has very, they have very long fingers and the fingers really make up the foil of the wing. They have um, stretched skin from the body that spreads along the arm through each finger and, that, and then around to the uh, back legs and the tail. And that's what makes up the, the wing. Uh, bats use echolocation, at least the nocturnal bats. Um, uh, they're only um, you, uh, among groups of animals is really the bats and then the whales and dolphins that primarily use echolocation. There's a few other species that do as well. But the idea is animal produces a vocalization. It's a sound wave that goes out, it hits an object, whether it's a tree, a rock, or an insect, and it bounces back. And based on the echo coming back, they can tell where that is, how big it is, um, by, by producing these rapid calls um, and can tell which direction those objects are, are moving. Um, so bats do have eyes, they can see, um, though they're gonna, a, a bat trying to fly around in the dark in you know, if a forested system where there's not, you know, there's no, the moon's kind of covered up, can't see very well, so they're gonna rely on echolocation. But a bat out in a wide open area um, on a moonlit night might not use echolocation as much, um, might fly by sight. So, uh, they do have a variety of vocalizations. Some we can hear. Uh, they've got some social calls and some hisses and things that we can hear. But the echolocation calls are at a frequency that we can't hear. It's too high, high a pitched um, for us. So as they're just flying around echolocating, usually it's just a, a steady uh, pulse rate. Um, but as they start approaching an object, they increase the rate they're vocalizing. And that gives them more and more information. Um, and that's particularly important when they're trying to catch a food item. They can produce hundreds of vocalizations per, per second um, when they're zeroing in on a, uh, something to grab. So bats are notoriously difficult to research. Um, they're out at night for, um, is a big part of that and we're kind of day creatures, so it gets us off our cycle. Um, and unlike the you know, nocturnal birds like owls that can pr they produce a loud vocalization that our ears can hear and interpret, um, bats don't. So we don't hear, we can't recognize their calls. Whereas if we 
come out here. Uh, now maybe we can hear owl hoot and we can say that's the great horned owl or that's the northern solid owl. It's not possible for bats. Um, and also bats are not really, you can't really trap them. They're not attracted to any sort of bait. You kind of have to just set up a big net if you want to catch them and hope they fly in. And since they're flying around, they're up in the air, they're not down low most of the time. So it's hard to get our hands on them. Um, so they're very difficult to study. So, but because they're echolocating frequently, um, they're producing a lot of sound waves. So we can record those with an ultrasonic recorder. Uh, I put an example on the table here, uh, kind of a game camera sized um, unit. Um, it has a microphone that uh, is attached. It gets extended about 10 feet in the air, um, records all the bats that are passing by using echolocation. And then after an extended period, we go pick it up, bring it back in, um, plug the SD card uh, into the computer and run it through a, a computer program. And it will tell us what species of bats uh, um, pass by and how many um, passes, so to speak, of the of each species um, they were. So in summer 23, I think it was in July, um, I actually had a, uh, did a survey here at Fields Pond, set out one of the detectors for two weeks or so, uh, came back and this, is, this isn't the results on this table, but um, we had five species out here, um, including the tricolor bat, which is a, a rare species, state threatened species. So Maine has eight species of bats, um, four are on the main state endangered species list, two is endangered, two is threatened, and the other four are considered species of special concern. Uh, the little brown bat was historically the most numerous bat in Maine, um, occurred statewide, very abundant, they were everywhere. Um, but then in 2010, a fungal pathogen that I, I'll talk more about here in a minute came through and wiped out 95% of their population. So they are now on the main state endangered species list. Uh, the Eastern small-footed bat is also affected by the pathogen. Um, they were, uh, they're currently a state threatened species. Um, one of our rarest bat. What's interested, interesting about the small-footed bat is in summer they roost in uh, cliffs, rock ledges, things like that. Um, so they kind of find a crack in rocks and then they wiggle in there and that's where they roost uh, during the summer, raise, have their pups in, the, in those sorts of habitats. Uh, Northern long-eared bat is both state and federally endangered. Uh, Tricolored bat, state threatened and has been proposed as federally endangered as well. Uh, the tricolor bat got its name because if you look at its hairs, there's three different shades uh, uh, of hair color on them. And for species that are relatively common in Maine, uh, still considered species of special concern, uh, silver haired, eastern red, big brown, and hoary bat. Um, interesting fact about the hoary bat is that the Hawaiian hoary bat is the only mammal native to Hawaii. Um, everything else has been introduced accidentally or on purpose. So uh, among Maine's eight bats, we can group them into uh, two groups. One's a tree bat, three species, the hoary, silver-haired, and red. Uh, these species don't hibernate, they're migratory. They leave Maine in the winter. Um, they roost and rear their young in the tree foliage, so up in the leaves. Uh, they tend to be solitary. These are more common species, generally living six, seven years, and they have two or three pups per year on average. And we have five species of cave bats. That's the little and big brown, small-footed, northern, and tricolors. Uh, these hibernate right here in Maine. Um, in summer, they're roosting in tree cavities, uh, rocky areas for the small-footeds under loose bark, and sometimes in buildings. That's the little brown and big browns. Uh, these species are not migratory, but they've been documented to go as far as 150 miles from where they summer and where they hibernate. Uh, they have low reproductive rates, generally just one pup per year, uh, but they're long lived. Um, and these tend to be our rarer species because they were affected by um, pathogens. 
So sometimes bats group together when they're hibernating. Uh, these are cave bats, so they're typically in caves, old mines, um, that, that sort of thing. Um, sometimes they group together, sometimes they're in uh, by themselves um, within the cave. So Maine has, uh, generally doesn't have met very many caves, so we don't have very many um, what are called hibernacula. So that's where bats hibernate in the winter. Um, so only four known in Maine, we monitor three regularly. Um, historically, prior to 2010, there are over uh, 300 bats usually per year um, when you combine them all together. Uh, about 80% of those are little brown bats, 20% northern long eared, and occasionally we get some of the others. Uh, but uh, white nose syndrome, uh, fungal pathogen hit in 2010. Uh, got its name from the white growth around the nose of the uh, affected bats. Um, it really affects, uh, infects the any exposed skin, so it attacks the around the nose and also the wings of the bat. So it can, and it can be flesh eating, eats right through the, the skin membranes of the wings. So they, some bats do survive uh, white nose, uh, and I'm sure this would be pretty. Uh, hard, you know, be hard for a bat to fly around with that sense of damage to its wings. Um, but the main source of mortality is really, um, they're really small animals. They don't have much for fat reserves. Um, and the fungus causes them to wake up more and to just groom themselves to get rid of the fungus. So they deplete those fat reserves and ultimately uh, starve to death or fly out, out of their hibernacula in winter and looking for food and don't find it. Um, die of exposure or whatever else. So uh, it, yeah, it's caused by a fungus, um, typically just referred to as PD because nobody can pronounce its scientific name. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's a, a fungus that originated in Europe. Bats there evolved with the fungus, so it doesn't affect the bats there. It was accidentally introduced to the United States and was found in New York in 2006 um, and has been spreading ever since. So here, in, yeah, you can see in the chart here, 2008, 2009, um, at, between the three hibernacula, we're talking 450, a little over 500 bats, and then it just tanked to single digits very, very quickly. Um, but, um, our current protocol is to survey our hibernacula once every three years. Uh, 2023 was a survey year. Um, so it was end of February, early March, we visited, the, visited them. And it's still only 35-ish bats, but it was technically the highest count we've had since 2011. So that's a little bit of encouragement. But um, something to note, note about white nose is, it, again, it doesn't affect the tree bats because they're not hibernating. So those... Uh, species were not affected by um, this pathogen. So here's kind of the map. This is an old map now, um, but you know, it's been spreading across from the east to the west. Um, in most most places in the uh, U.S. at this point. So uh, generally, bat habitat in summer is considered not to be really limiting here in Maine. Uh, they live in trees and there's lots and lots of trees in Maine. But where they hibernate is kind of limiting. There's not many hibernacula, as I just said. Um, so there's, it's a very important habitat for um, our bat ecology here in Maine. So we try to um, protect our hibernacula uh, as much as we can. So we try to limit human entry into those. Um, we put up signage saying, Stay out is a bad hibernaculum. Um, and in one case, we have put up a gate to physically block people from um, getting in. So there's kind of a great grates um, that are spaced uh, large enough that bats can fly in and out as much as they want, but um, people are prevented from getting in. But um, another aspect is, as I noticed, uh, noted earlier, there were only really four or 500 bats in our hibernacula that we knew about. And there were certainly much more than 500 bats pre-white nose syndrome in Maine. 
and we didn't know where they were hibernating. So we worked with uh, the University of Maine, uh, grad student Chris Helica and Dr. Eric, Eric Blumberg to study, study what we call non-traditional hibernacula. Um, the study kind of came about is when White Nose hit in 2010, Acadia National Park staff started finding dead bats on the landscape in the winter, uh, far from any known cave. Uh, so uh, it got us interested in poking around to find out where they were actually hibernating. Uh, and in other states, they have previously documented bats hiding in rocky crevices. So um, we initiated this study to further investigate that in Maine. Um, so Chris went out and put out a bunch of acoustic detectors um, on the landscape in winter in these talus slopes. So generally large piles of rock under, under cliff faces. Um, and sure enough, he did find that four of our species um, were hibernating in um, talus slopes. So he was not able to find tricolored bats, but um, big browns, little browns, small footed and northern long eared were all documented in various um, locations in talus slopes. Um, and they also found that the, generally the larger, more open, meaning less trees, slopes were more likely to be occupied. So this is kind of a map, a rough map of kind of cliff talus features in Maine. So it's much more extensive than the four hibernacula that we know about. So this is pr not that there's bats hibernating in all these areas, but um, probably much more potential of bats hibernating in talus than there is in uh, natural caves in Maine. Um, and that's very different than other parts of the country where there are large caves or old mines where there can be 100,000 bats in one cave. So, so uh, in Maine, we do have a, we do a lot of population monitoring using the acoustic equipment. Um, I mentioned earlier, uh, historically, we didn't have a lot of information on the status of our bat populations. Um, we just kind of knew they were around and they seemed to be abundant. So that was good enough at the time um, until there were no more bats around. So since we've been really amping up our population monitoring since then, um, primarily through acoustics. Um, the, there is the North American Bat Monitoring Program, uh, which is a, an effort overseen by the U.S. Geological Survey and um, uh, primarily with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and a lot of other partners involved as well. And they've put forward um, kind of standardized protocols and they, it acts kind of as a depository for bat monitoring data across the continent. So uh, people go out and do surveys and then they submit their data to this uh, effort. Um, so then collectively other researchers can look at that data and um, analyze trends in the bat populations at the um, state, regional, and continental scales. Um, so when we first got into uh, acoustic monitoring, we really adhered to the, the NA bat methodology uh, for a couple of years, and then we veered a little bit into focusing on driving surveys. So most of the surveys we do are just setting those detectors up in the woods, in a field, on uh, wetlands, those sorts of things, and leaving them there. So we call those stationary surveys. And they're great at finding what bats are in an, are in an area because sooner or later, every bat's gonna fly by. Uh, or at least every species should fly by that uh, detector and get recorded. But they're not very good at telling you how many bats there are. because so you can have one bat just flying around the microphone hundreds of times. Um, and it looks like a lot of bats, but it's really just one individual who likes that one little area right by the microphone. So, but, so we also do the driving surveys are better at telling you how many bats there are uh, because you're driving down the road at 20 miles per hour, which is faster than a bat typically flies. Um, so each recording should be a different bat. Um, so they're very good at detecting trends in abundance, but, uh, they're not good at doing that for rare species. So if you have a very rare species, like an Eastern small-footed bat, it's very rare on the landscape. Your trajectory of driving the vehicle and the 
that's trajectory have to line up exactly at the right time to be able to record it. So we've never found an Eastern small footed bat on a driving survey. So that's what we kind of have to use both methodologies to really see what's going on in the bat population. Uh, so we did driving surveys primarily for a couple of years and then we switched to doing primarily stationary surveys for a few years. And the real goal uh, collectively was to uh, get a better understanding on the distribution and relative abundance of our bats, um, monitor core scale population trends, and ultimately design a long-term monitoring plan, which is where we are now. Um, and we launched it in two, 2022. So for long-term monitoring, uh, we're looking at occupancy during the maternity season. So that's in summer when they're breeding, uh, and occupancy is essentially uh, the percentage of sites that have each species. So maybe um, one species has 50, is at 50% of sites, one, maybe one's at 30% of sites um, and so forth. So our goal is to monitor 350 sites um, split over two years. So one set of 175, and even years, a different set of 175 and odd years and repeat those sites through time so that if, we start at 50% occupancy for one species and it goes up to 70. We know we're doing well. It goes down to 30. We know it's not doing so well. Um, and that will give us a pretty good understanding on um, how our bat populations are doing. But we're going to do additional sites as time allows. Um, at least the protocol for now is to go with 14 consecutive nights. Um, and we'll supplement with the mobile sur surveys as time allows. So since we're splitting between even um, in odd years, we've now just done one full cycle between 2022 and 23, and we'll start a new cycle, um, really the first repeated cycle um, this coming summer. So in 2023, um, I was able to get data from 256 sites, um, getting some, some sites con contributed by uh, our partners at Maine DOT and the National Wildlife Refuge System. Um, and Baxter State Park also had a couple of my detectors and their staff were running those. Um, but um, using the computer software, we were able to identify nearly 260,000 bat recordings from the uh, summer of 2023. Um, and what is pretty typical for us, uh, about 80, 85% of those recordings are attributed to one of three species. So those are th uh, pretty clearly our three most abundant species on the main landscape. So silver-haired bat, big brown bat, and quarry bat. But there still seems to be some, a good chunk of little brown bats out there, some red bats, but um, tricolored, northern long-eared, and small-footed collectively, those three species combined for only about 1% of all our recordings. So those are very rare on the main landscape. So all those little red, red dots on the main map there are where we surveyed this year, well, 2023. Pink squiggles are the 14 mobile routes that we were able to complete as well. So we've been working with uh, that researchers at Virginia Tech, namely Jesse De La Cruz and Dr. Mark Ford. Um, they've been helping us develop our methodologies and have also been um, doing some occupancy modeling for us. So essentially that's taking uh, our records of where we find the bats and where we don't find the bats and matching it with some remotely sensed data um, to try to explain why we're finding bats in one spot, and not in another spot. Um, so some of the outputs are these, uh, these graphs. So this is for little brown bats. Um, and it kind of shows some of the habitat relationships that we, we see. Um, so little brown bats at um, the chances of detecting little brown bat, for example, decrease as the amount of deciduous forest in, the, in an area in, uh, increases, or conversely, the chances of finding little brown bat increase as a percent of open water increases. So, and another part of their analysis is once they've kind of identified the habitat relationships, they can kind of flip it and project where the bats are likely to be on the main landscape. So this is, um, it's uh, pro occupancy probability maps. Um, so what is the likelihood of that species being in any particular spot on the main landscape? 
Uh, the blues being unlikely to be occupied that, by that species, the reds being very likely to be occupied. So it shows that our tree bats are doing quite well. Quarry bats are basically everywhere. It's pretty rare to set for us to set out a detector and not get a hoary bat. Uh, Silver-haired bats doing very well in the northern half of the state. Um, we don't find them as much on the southern part or coastal areas, but they are still present in some spots. Uh, and the red bat is also statewide, just not as common as the hoary bats. So part of their analysis is also includes year as a variable, and that has come out as significant for silver-haired and eastern red bats, uh, suggesting that those two species are increasing uh, since we started monitoring in 2015. So that's a good thing. So kind of, there's kind of a dichotomy with our cave bats. Uh, big brown bats, very common still in the southern half of the state. Um, we don't find them in the big woods in the north in the northwest parts of the state um, very much. Um, that species was affected by white nose syndrome, but not nowhere near to the degree, degree that our little browns or the other species were. Um, seems to be more of like a 30% decline. Uh, but again, the, the modeling suggests that big browns are also increasing. Uh, little browns, despite dropping 95% of their population, um, <coughs> still seem to be pretty much statewide. Um, we don't find them quite as much in very southern Maine, but uh, they still have a very high, they're still uh, out, out in the majority of Maine's landscape. I think last, in 2023, about 70% of all our surveys detected uh, little brown bats. Um, they're just uh, at a much, much lower population density than what they used to be. But the modeling also is suggesting that that species is increasing. So um, we're perhaps seeing the start of a recovery from white nose syndrome for them. But then we have three other, the three rare species um, with lots of blue. You can see a couple little reddish spots in places for those three species, the small footed, northern and tricolors. Um, but they are not doing very well very rare on the main landscape. Um, and statistically, there was not uh, a dec significant decline in northern or tricolors, but those two species do seem to still be declining somewhat. Um, so uh, also, since it's on this uh, slide, we just listed tricolored bats as a state threatened species in 2023. So that's a new addition for us. All right, so uh, what you can do for bats. So the primary thing for helping bats is avoiding disturbance. Uh, they're uh, roosting and raising their young in the summer. So if you can avoid cutting a tree that has bats in it, um, May 15th, uh, August 15th, then it's best to uh, avoid it at that time. You can conserve habitat, uh, snags. So standing dead trees are really important. They uh, a lot of the bats will roost in those. Um, and community science, we've got a uh, bat roost reportings page on our website that you can report any colonies that you know about through that. Uh, probably most importantly is to just avoid caves in winter. Um, bats really need to conserve their energy and every time they get disturbed by um, someone or something going into the caves, it causes them to wake up and burn those uh, precious calories. So bat houses, they're, um, uh, they can help on uh, bat populations in some certain, some circumstances. Uh, they see, there is some conflicting information about, you know, recommendations um, for where to put them uh, on the, on the internet if you're searching around, but seems like they prefer houses on buildings rather than on poles or trees. <coughs> um, they should be put in places where they get a lot of sun, um, at least six hours per day. Um, there is some risk of putting them out in complete sun um, of them getting overheated, um, and which has caused some mortalities of bats in, in uh, boxes before. They tend to get used more if they're 20 to uh, 10 to 20 feet off the ground. That's more where bats are flying around typically, so easier for them to get in there. 
needs to be clear vegetation below because they're going to swoop down and then up to get it, uh, to get into the box. Uh, bigger is generally better. There's multi-chamber kind of different rooms in the boxes um, of some boxes. Those are the preferred uh, boxes because there's um, can be different temperatures within the box structure. So the bats can search around for the temperature they're really looking for. And more boxes tend to get used, uh, tends to be, be, seems to be better. So um, it does, bats are pretty loyal to their roof sites. Um, so it can take a long time for them to find and start using a box. Then generally they're gonna be, um, use it there for a while thereafter. But there seems to be some evidence that if you put multiple boxes up, they're more likely to start using your boxes rather than just one single box. So I, we have a bat trunk. Uh, the department uh, has a bat trunk that our information and education group oversees. Uh, I brought it, people can poke through uh, that came in person, but it's got books and videos and uh, some activities, a couple of uh, mounts, um, really designed for educators to loan out and uh, bring into the classroom to talk bats to, to kids. So um, be signed out by contacting Laura Craver Rogers uh, in our August office. Um, usually when I do a talk about bats, I ask her if it's available and she says, no, it's signed out, but it was available today. So I brought it. <laughs> so yeah, trying to get it in October is just, it's not going to happen. <laughs> so people are thinking of bats on the brain then. So uh, occasionally, bats do cause problems uh, getting into uh, getting into buildings. Uh, so generally, if one gets into a living space, we just suggest closing all your interior doors, open the exterior doors, windows, and it will get out on its own. Uh, they do sometimes um, in summer and even in the winter like to uh, get into the attics or crawl spaces um, to roost or hibernate. Uh, and the, the best way to get them out is to do an exclusion, um, which is where you put in a one-way door so the bats go out, but they can't get back in. Um, but we don't want you to be doing that in winter when they should be hibernating and it's cold outside. So it, um, because they do occasionally wake up from hibernation and fly out to stretch their wings, um, get, maybe get a drink of water and they go back into hibernation mode. So if you exclude them then, they're out in the winter and they're gonna die. So we don't want, want you doing it then. And we don't want you doing it in summer when there could be babies in the attic that would get um, orphaned and die. So we restrict it to mid-August to mid-October. There's a small window in the spring too. Um, but <coughs> and the idea is to get all the bats out and you plug up all the holes in the house uh, and then it should be good to go, no more bats. Um, and the department does have what we call animal damage control agents that don't work for us, but they have to get licensed through us to work with nuisance wildlife. Um, there's a list of them on our website. Um, some of them, no, not certainly not all, do bat exclusions. So they're good people to hire if anybody ever had a bat issue they had to um, deal with. So uh, bats do occasionally get found on the ground. Um, you know, they you know, might be out in the night flying around, get too tired, can't make it back, and they just land on the ground or they're sick or something going on. Um, so usually the best thing to do is just leave them, leave them alone or um, you could try to get them up into a more elevated area so that it's better, easier for them to take off and fly off that next night. But um, bats do carry rabies, so they should never be handled with bare hands, uh, ideally not at all. But um, it's a pretty rare that bats have rabies, but it is an, uh, uh, something you need to be aware of. So about eight per year test positive here in Maine. It's only about 4% of what does get tested, but they only get tested if there's some sort of exposure. So somebody finds their dog with a bat in its mouth is going to get tested or if it bites somebody or is in a room where um, you don't know if it bit somebody or not. So. Um, so it's kind of an, uh, the bats that get tested are really 
more at risk than the natural wild population, which probably only has a 1% or so rabies positive rate. So we have, do have four licensed re rehabilitators in Maine that take bats. So they're always good um, sources of information if you found a sick or injured bat. Um, and th those are the people we direct you to if um, you had a bat that needed to go get rehabilitated somewhere. So Center for Wildlife in New York, Saco River in Wilmington, Misfits in Auburn and Acadia Wildlife Center in Bar Harbor. That's all I have. Let's see, I have some questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you usually bats tend to avoid the light areas because it eliminates them and they are, they do get predated by owls. So if they're out where they could be seen, owls can swoop in and grab them. So they might not, yeah, it's good for the, it tracks the insects, but probably not so good for the bats, I would think, but, so. Um, yep. Do they bite you when you're sleeping, say, or they just keep up the whole Yeah, right, yeah, most people, oh, yeah, good idea. Yeah, so the question would be, was if they're up in the attic, are they uh, concerned to people? Do they bite people? So generally, if they're up in the attic, most of the time, people don't even know they're there. So that, um, but yeah, there can be some disease. There are disease concerns with iguano and, and things like that. So it is usually best to get them out of the, any houses that are occupied. But usually that they're not, you know, flying around seeking out people at all. They're not interested in coming close to people. Uh, people are potential predators they, in their mind, so they're not going to come close. So, um, but yeah. Are they concerned about like the declining population? Oh, the birds are declining. Hmm. Yep. That that. Yeah, so the question was, if the, is there any concern about decreases in insect populations? Um, I haven't heard that come up in the bat world yet, but I'm sure there's probably in places documented declines in insects, but um, I haven't heard it come up yet in terms of bat populations. But, so. Yeah. Um, so as far as the bicolored bat, why yep. do you think that one is lowering it? I know there was the, the cave bat had the yep. but what do you think about? Yeah, so tricolors are seem to be heavily affected by the white nose syndrome too. So they are they, they are considered a cave bat. They roost in caves. We've only found them in our caves a couple times. So we don't really have a good handle where the, that species is hibernating in Maine, but why don't we get some questions and I can ask them right. online. Um, why are bat populations significantly lower along the coast, do you think? Hmm, along the coast. Scan back. No, it, it's kind of species specific. Um, so some species are, are more common along the coast. The so red bats tend to be more common. Um, Small-footed bats tend to be more common in the coastal areas, not necessarily right on the coast. Um, yeah, so I guess I don't don't have a good good answer for that. But um, so some some of our species, the small-footed and the northern long-eared, seem to be associated with steeper slopes, so more mount, mountainous areas. So um, not as many of those regions right on the on the coast, so there's certainly some. Uh, um, another question from online. Is there any way to control? So there's been, there's some ongoing research uh, looking at ways to uh, control it using UV light. Uh, there's some research on a vaccine type thing. Um, 
There's some research on manipulating the, uh, the hibernacula themselves. So um, there's some indication that the surviving bats tend to be in the colder areas of the cave. So there, there's been some tests on inter trying to cool down the hibernacula to see if that helps survival. Um, so currently is the, it, it's all kind of in the research phase and isn't in widespread use at this point, but um, hopefully um, be a wider, wider use of those, those tools at, at some point. But. Thank you. Um, do you know if there is a phone app for IDing bat calls, kind of like how Merlin has the bird calls? Yeah. So the limitation is that you need a specific ultrasonic recorder to be able to detect them. Um, so the, there is uh, what's called an echo meter that you can buy through Wildlife Acoustics, which is a company. Um, and it can plug right into your phone and there's a free downloadable app that will um, identify any bats that fly by as you, as you walk around with your, your smartphone outside. So it's using, essentially using the microphone on your smartphone um, uh, plus the ultrasonic piece that plugs into the USB port. Um, so that does happen. It, uh, I, we, the department has bought a few in the past. Um, <laughs> there, there's an old version in there, yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's usually, it's a few hundred bucks, I think, to buy one of those devices. Um, but yeah. Is there any study going on about how climate change will affect that? Yeah, so the question was, is there any study going on um, about how climate change will affect that? Um, not currently in Maine. I would guess somebody's looking at it somewhere, but um, I don't know specifically. But yeah. Do uh, bats eat brown down moths? Chances are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm pretty sure they would. Nice. Nice, tasty, big moth. So, like the birds don't eat the caterpillars. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah, I don't know it for sure, but I would guess. But I don't know. So, yeah. Could you talk about to identify the common ones in Maine? Yep. So yeah, most of the time you're not going to be able to unless it's right in your hand, which it shouldn't happen. But <laughs> so, oh, so yeah, the, for those online, uh, the question was how to identify the bats. So I'll flip back here. So uh, so the tree bats are pretty easy to identify. Um, Silver-haired bat, um, it's kind of a black face, and then silverish black for. Uh, I guess slightly resembles the hoary bat, but the hoary has kind of a yellow chin to it. Um, so that kind of differentiates those species. The red bat is kind of unlike anything that anything else, uh, kind of the orangish face, um, uh, and a little bit diff different uh, for on the back. Um, but big browns can be pretty easily confused with some of the rare species, kind of a brownish, uh, glossy fur. Um, they do tend to be a little bit bit. Uh, they are bigger than the little brown bats. That's kind of you know, main differentiating feature there. Um, but um, with the oh uh, yeah, it's a good question. So big browns might have a ten inch wingspan. Little browns eight or nine, something like that. That's off the top of my head. I'm probably botching that. But um, so it's not a huge difference. Body length is a little considerably different, I think. But um, so small footed are smallest bat. Um, they've got a pretty prominent black mask on their face, so that kind of sticks out for them. Um, the northern long eared another brown bat, but they have their ears are long enough that if you fold them forward, they go past the nose. So that's the differentiating feature for them. Um, 
And tricolored bats, I talked about the fur earlier. They also have kind of pinkish forearms. Um, so that would differentiate that species. But very, very unlikely to see anything other than the little brown or the big brown bat. So. Yeah. Is that because of the habitat loss with all the trees? Or yeah, it's the fungus that's driving that. Yeah. Just yeah. the fungus? Just the fun. Well, I'm sure the generally loss of habitat is going to impact everything, but it's minor. Uh, so, what happens to them if Rick cuts into their tree bows like that? They yep. pick up yeah, they, they, they cover, you know, several mile area, uh, the home range is several miles. So um, if one patch of forest is clear, well, if it, it's a forestry operation is clear cut, they'd probably lose, you know, whatever trees they're using that immediate area, they just shift over. But they do, they'll forage, they forage out in open areas. So they'll often come out into clear cut areas to forage and so it's a little bit of, uh, you know, if they if they lose their roots tree, it displaces them a little bit. But um, doesn't the number of potential roots trees doesn't seem to be limiting. So, so they go 150 miles. Up, yeah, they the little browns have been documented going 150 up to 150 miles between summer and winter. But, so, so they do find them in other states as far down that I've seen. Oh yeah, them. yeah. Yeah. So yeah, all these species are pretty wide ranging still. So mm -hmm. yeah. So the question was using modus towers. Uh, so we haven't been marking any bats um, for, within IF and W, but there are other researchers in North America that are putting modus tags on. So um, they are getting picked up in, in places on those towers. So there is a chance that you'd get a bat coming through at some point. Uh, yep. You mentioned earlier that you cannot test for it. Yeah. So um, the best thing that we could do as landowners is dead trees up for the bats? Yep, keep the dead trees up is really uh, the best thing for them. Obviously, you don't want to you know, dead tree fall on your house, but otherwise, out beyond that, that is a really valuable habitat component for them. Um, so, so, because they eat bugs, so right? They eat bugs. Probably, too, right? Uh, probably yeah. not. Those are on either. Yeah, yeah. So they probably don't yeah, eat ticks. <laughs> So something, yeah, something I didn't mention earlier is um, northern the northern long-eared bat is pretty um, a species that's really forest interior. So it's flying in you know the uh, thicker forests, and it will fly and pick insects off from trees too. It's considered considered a gleaner. So it's not just grabbing them that they're flying around, but it can spot them on leaves and grab them, which is. Yeah, ticks are probably too small, and either they're on animals already, or they're down in the, you know, in the grass. Um, just the love, not, bats aren't flying through there. So, yeah, yeah, right. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's probably cavers. So there's a group of people that like to uh, go into caves and investigate. So they probably, the theory is, yeah, someone went to Europe and then didn't clean their equipment when they came back and introduced it. Interestingly, I recently did some caves um, this summer and they were asking about where they had been before you enter the cave. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, there's a pretty thorough protocol where it's for deep decontamination that should be followed if you go into any caves. Uh, 
to prevent any further spread of it. You know? uh, uh, we got some more questions over yep. here too. Are you finding significant bat mortality from wind towers? Yep. So there, this uh, wind towers do occasionally uh, kill bats. Uh, the tree bats. Uh, these these guys tend to be the ones that are most often killed. Um, so because they're migratory, they fly uh, tend to fly um, tend to be high, fly a little higher probably than our cave bats. And um, so um, yeah, they do get do fly into uh, turbines once in a while. So. Um, so, uh, Linda asks. Is it possible that the talus piles segregate the bats and may help to prevent white nose? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, so for, I would guess we don't, because there are such piles of rock, the, the openings are so small, people can't get in there to test whether the fungus is down where the bats are. So in the talus, the bats are probably crawling down deep enough so they get down to a cave-like environment where it's warmer than that environment outside. Um, so it's probably a place that the fungus is still living, but we don't know that because we can't really get in there to test that. Um, but the, the fact that there's probably more of those areas around the state than just the caves probably does spread out the, the risk a little bit. Um, Um, and putting bat houses on your house instead of a tree or pole, does that increase the chances of them coming into your house or attic? Yeah, so bats are probably just around and they're kind of looking for places to get into at some point. So if there's an opportunity to get into a house, they'll probably take that opportunity. Um, if there's a um, house on the side, it might help draw, draw them to the house, might keep them out of the attic, but it's kind of hard, hard to tell, but. Can they, do people slow windmills to uh, make it safer for bats? Yes, yep, that's a good point. So, um, our primary means of uh, addressing back concerns with uh, wind facilities is the use of curtailment. So that's limiting when the turbines can spin. So in the summer, when bats are active, um, the turbines can only kick in at a kick in at a higher speed. So right now they can essentially spin anytime because bats are not out and active. But at, in summer, um, the wind speed has to be high enough. Um, before the before the turbines are allowed to kick in and start generating, so um, for for some, yeah, so it, it's kind of dependent on which wind facility what the speed is, but um, uh, which goes and there's a variety of factors that influence that, but um, yeah, so we definitely are limiting when turbines can spin based on when bats are likely to be in the area. The low wind speeds in summer, the turbines spin less often than they do now when bats are not on the landscape. And we work that work on that through the um, permitting process when there's a new wind facility in development. Oh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, which one of Maine's bats is your favorite? Oh, that's why? a good question. <laughs> that's a good question. Huh. I don't know. Maybe the red bat, because they're just so different and colorful. But rather than just the drab gray, they're just this nice <laughs> bright color. <laughs> but, so. So. Oh. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>